Hi, I'm Cole Onsen, and this is Diary of a Screen Actor. Today, we'll be joined by William Mark McCullough, an actor, writer, director, and producer who has been in a great many things, most recently uh, Walking Dead, in Hillbilly Elegy, in a whole slew of things you can see on his IMDb, which I will link below. Mark is a wonderful storyteller and just really... Uh, hits the nail on the head with a lot of mindset pieces, plus just hilarious stories. What a guy. Enjoy. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. I've got William Mark McCullough here. I wonder, Mark, would you mind telling us about yourself, how you got started, who you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, well, I'm an actor, uh, first and foremost, and I also have a production company. I'm a director and producer and writer. Um, you know, I tell folks I love acting and I do it for free. Uh, I would not direct or produce or write for free. I enjoy those <laughs> things as well, but not as much. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, prior to becoming an actor, I was a lawyer and that was not the career for me. Uh, I uh, would we'll probably talk about that a little more in detail later, but uh, I decided that uh, my passion was in film and TV. And uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of a nutshell of what I do. Brilliant. Uh, I did ask my community for questions that they might have for you. And one of the ones was, how did you go from lawyer to actor? So I wonder, would you mind telling us your origin story? <laughs> sure. I wish I was a superhero with a great origin story. Um, <laughs> So basically, you know, I I grew up in a trailer park in rural Georgia. So the idea of being an actor never crossed my mind. You know, it was just not something that folks that I knew, people I was around, it, you know, pursuing a career in the arts was just not something that was at the forefront of people's lives. And uh, I, I went to college and I was studying political science. And the school I went to required that I take uh, an art class. And my choice was acting or art history. And I was pretty sure I'd fail art history. So I was like, well, I'll do that. <laughs> and it's funny because I walked in with such disdain my first day of class because I loved them, but we all know the theater kids in, in school. And, you know, they were, they were a little centric, a little crazy. And I've always been a pretty straight laced, you know, just very down to earth, normal guy. So I thought I was going to hate this class. And I remember I took, you know, I had my first uh, monologue and there was probably 11 people in class, this little classroom, we had fluorescent lighting. And when I finished the monologue, my whole body was on fire. And I realized this is amazing. The problem is uh, my school didn't teach me one thing about how to get a job once you get out of school. So we spent all this time learning the craft of theater acting. And I graduated and I was just lost. I didn't know how to do the most basic things like put together a resume, you know, where, to, where do you go to find auditions? Where do you go to make a living? So like a lot of folks who I think are lost after college, I went to law school. And I did enjoy, you know, I loved politics and things like that. So I thought, oh, maybe going to DC and law school will kind of take away this thing about with acting. So I went to law school in DC and um, after law school, I started working as a prosecutor. And I was thinking that standing in front of a jury would feed that, that desire to perform in front of an audience. And it, it did, you know, you realize that, uh, the real world is so different from the TV world for a lawyer. You know, so much of my time was spent writing briefs and doing research. Very little time was spent standing from a jury. And I'd taken a trip down to Nicaragua, just personal, you know, adventure trip. And uh, I was in a really bad car accident and spent about four or five weeks down there. And oh my just, gosh. yeah, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because lying in the hospital bed, it made me reevaluate my life. And I realized I was taking this path that I wasn't passionate about at all. And I was doing it as like a, a backup, a second best option. And I thought life's too short to, to follow your second best option. And so when I healed up enough, I got back to DC and quit my job and uh, very soon thereafter moved to LA to start pursuing acting. Wow, what a, what a catalyst, you know? Some people, some people just decide one day that that's it, but wow, that's really... <laughs> That's really something to show you what it was time to start doing. So what mm -hmm. happened when you got to LA? Uh, I was hungry for a very long time. <laughs> so oh, no. I, 
I knew, <laughs> knew no one in LA. I had uh, no training for on camera work. You know, my background had been in theater. And uh, I, didn't, I think I showed up with 800 bucks in my pocket. You know, I had no money, no connections, nothing. And I started what I lovingly refer to as my ramen noodle years. <laughs> It was just, I did every stupid thing that a person can do pursuing acting. I, I just didn't know. I had, you know, and it was just so hard to find the right steps to take. You know, I took a bunch of acting classes, most of which were taught by people who had never booked a professional acting job in their life. And so they were giving me advice on how to do something that they had failed at trying to do. And I just spun my wheels over and over and over and over and made a mistake, a mistake, a mistake. But what I've always been pretty good at is I try not to make the same mistake twice. And so I'd mess something up, figure out that didn't work and try something else. Really, it was when I, I found some working actors and started studying with them that it helped transform my career. And I went from having no idea what to do and struggling and doing, you know, tons of student films and short films and things that are, you know, that was a good foundation to learn how to act on camera. But I needed the, to know how to transition to actually making a career out of acting. And those folks who were actually working actors kind of gave me some guidance on doing that. That's really, you know, valid. And I want to hoping you'll talk about the value of having a community as an actor and what to look for. You know, I, I think that everyone's different. Uh, you know, some folks really crave uh, a community, uh, uh, you know, a team, uh, folks they can reach out to. Um, and, you know, I, I live in, in a little rural town outside of Savannah, Georgia. So, you know, it's not teaming with a lot of working actors. Right? <laughs> so, what I do is I surround myself with people with a winning mindset. Mm. I think that is much more critical in the long term than surrounding yourself by actors. Nothing, nothing wrong with actors. Mm -hmm. But when I first got to LA, I took a bunch of acting classes with actors who had a loser mindset, right? And they would complain about they're not getting auditions or they're not getting this or not getting that and how the world's out to, you know, it was just one excuse and one complaint after another. And I saw folks get into that, that group and it just pulled them down. If someone tried to like break out of that, the folks around them, they didn't want to see that person succeed and they would do things to pull them down. So I think it's important to surround yourself with people who number one, want you to succeed, right? Like they, they, they've got to want you uh, to be successful. And it has to be people who have a drive and a passion for whatever it is they do. I, mean, I have friends who are lawyers, friends who are entrepreneurs, who run construction companies. It doesn't matter to me. I can... I get so much joy being around people who love what they do. I don't care what it is. And if they, if they inspire me with their passion, that's the kind of person I want to be with. Now, specifically to acting, if you're in a community, in a larger city where there's a lot of actors around, um, you know, find actors in acting classes. I mean, there's so, it's so easy now with you know, the internet, social media to, to get a group together. But I would say use, use the rule of only quality people which is a rule I use in my, in my general life. I, I do not waste time with people who aren't quality. Um, I don't need a cheerleading gang, but also yeah. don't need someone who stands in my way, right? So I only bring people into my circle who are supportive and loving and, and inspiring. So find those actors who do that for you. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to find someone who's a mentor, who's, you know, a little higher up the, the, the career ladder than you are, great, you, you know, consider that, you know, a, a gift. Um, but the key, I think, is just folks who, who are, who have a positive mindset and understand what's important and what's. That's brilliant. Um, in terms of other core mindset principles, do you have any others that are right up there with quality people and a really awesome positive group? Sure. I think, well, first and, and foremost, I do believe that acting is a singular profession, right? I mean, we, we work in a collaborative process with directors, with casting directors, with other actors, but the real work is done by yourself at your house, right? Like the, the, the way I look at it, my job as an actor is 
doing the things that are necessary to get auditions. I mean, that includes marketing, that includes networking, uh, delivering quality auditions, you know, just doing the things that aren't necessarily fun. I mean, auditions can be fun, obviously, but uh, it's doing the, the, the work, the real work. Once I go to set, that's vacation for me. That, that, there's nothing work related about getting to play make believe on set. That's fun. <laughs> All the work I do is to get me there on vacation, right? So there's a lot of mindset uh, principles I think they're important. Number one is, is an understanding that who you are today is enough. Uh, so many people, I think, don't have this. They have this idea that they're not enough. They need something special to make them stand out, uh, not realizing that they just embraced who they were and their history and their passions and their hates and prejudices and loves and experiences, that by itself would make them extraordinarily special. Um, I wish that someone had told me that when I first started pursuing acting, that I didn't need to become something else, that who I was was enough. I think staying positive because this business has ups and downs for everyone and when I'm booking things left and right, I don't think, oh, I'm amazing, right? I'm grateful for what's happening, but I understand it's a cycle. And if I go a couple months without booking, I don't think, oh my God, I'm terrible. It's just a cycle, right? So I just stay positive and focused. Um, I think that, you know, being, being confident in your abilities and your knowledge is, is important. And also being open to learning new things and taking guidance is important as you move up the ladder because, you know, all the time I face new issues and I, I reach out to people who are further along this path than I am to get feedback on their advice on what I should do if I'm faced with some particular issue. Hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about coaching um, sure. and ongoing training, right? So one thing that they always say is that ongoing training, ongoing study and practice is uh, incredibly important. I wonder when you get to a point in your career, like you are that, I mean, you book on all kinds of things all the time. Um, what does training or coaching, what does that look like? Do you, I mean, are there coaches on set? Are you practicing with people or is it more like you get to work so much that that is your ongoing training? Uh, there, there are coaches for kids. Like I, I was recently doing some onset coaching for a little six-year-old who's working on a TV show. But for adults, they expect you to show up and do your job, right? Um, when I used to do a lot of coaching and teaching, I would tell my students that my goal was to get them good fast so they're so busy they can't take my classes anymore. <laughs> I like so that. I don't buy into the fact that you have to always be in training and coaching your whole life. I just don't. Um, if it gives you comfort, great. Or if you're someone who just has a, has a hard time breaking down a scene and understanding what's going on, get a coach. But I think, you know, it's like anything, once you learn how to do something and you have the foundation and the right mindset, you just do it, you know? And, and acting at its core is easy. Any six-year-old can tell you how to play make-believe. You know, I think <laughs> people are very complicated. Um, you know, I know folks, I have lots of friends who are acting teachers who are amazing acting teachers and, and I have taught acting, but there are people who make a living as acting teachers and there's nothing wrong with that. But I've definitely in LA, I saw folks who would make acting, the process of acting extraordinarily complicated so that their students would have to continue to come back to classes to learn this complicated process because that's how they pay their bills, right? So for example, when I was in law school, I was taking a contracts class and my professor gave me a list of things to write up in a contract. And I did so. He called me to his office. And I remember sitting down and my contract is sitting on his desk. And I think I'm about to get told, oh, great job, Mark. I really love this contract. And he <laughs> slides over to me and he says, why did you write it like this? Right? And I said, well, you know, my, my mom and my grandma were not educated. So I wrote it so that someone like my mom or grandma could read it and understand it. And he says to me, if they can read it and understand it, they don't need to hire us. Wow. And it struck me, right? So I think there's a lot of acting teachers who make things really complicated. So you have to keep paying them to learn the process. Uh, so again, don't take this as I'm telling people not to take acting classes. I think you should take acting classes. Uh, but, they're, but I see people get caught up in what I call the acting class treadmill, right? They're not having success in their career. And so they take another acting class and a different acting class and a different method. 
learn one. There's no, there's, it's, out, it's art, right? There's no right or wrong way to act. Learn a method to act, you know, learn the foundations, get good at it, and then get so busy working, you don't have time to take acting classes, right? If you're on set and you're working and you're working with top tier actors, you're going, it, that is training, right? I mean, you're going to have to be on your toes to do that. And uh, so that's what I always tell folks to do. Just get busy acting. Um, but obviously, to get on set, to start acting, there's a lot of things that go in that that have nothing to do with the talent or the skill of acting. So you Tell have to learn more. those as well. Tell us more. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I teach a two-day, 16-hour class on how to become a working actor. And I'm a firm believer that any human being who wants to become a working actor can. Like I said, I live out in the country and I could take anybody within a mile of my house and I am not surrounded by thespians, I can promise you that. And if they did everything I told them to do for one year, they could be on TV shows and major films. No doubt about that. Because it's just a business. At its core, we are selling a product. Now we happen to be the product, but that's all it is, we're selling a product. Uh, we have an agent who is our VP of sales. You know, they handle our sales. You know, our agent, our manager, and ourselves handle marketing this product. Um, I think so many folks go into acting thinking of it purely from a craft perspective and from an art perspective. And that obviously is a part of it, but it is not the most important part. Money is the most important part. Now, it doesn't have to be important to you, but is it important to the people who run the system? You know, keeping in uh, mind, I suppose that that's where their mind is at when we don't, when we don't get the role. There's probably lots of reasons behind mm -hmm. it. Why dates change? Why locations change? Like, I think it's important to keep the perspective that you're just one cog in the entire money making machine, <laughs> right? And there's so many things about. I was just talking to an actor earlier today who called me up and asked some questions that she'd had a call back and didn't know if she got it or not. And I told her, just let it go. So the last film that I made, we had, we had had a casting session for the main family in the film. And literally on the wall of our production office, we had a blonde family and a brunette family, right? And it came down to another character. If, if we cast an actor who was gonna be a brunette, we'd go with the blonde family. If we went with the blonde character for this, we'd go to the brunette family. The actors have nothing they can do about that, right? I mean, they didn't right. even know. But we literally had two full families, headshots up on our wall, and it came down to this, this casting that had nothing at all to do with them. And so that, that blonde family didn't get the job, not because they weren't amazing, not because they didn't do a great callback. It's because we had a brunette over here and it needed to, we need to have a contrast, right? So you can't take this stuff personally. It's just business. It, and it's so many things that are out of your control. So don't worry about it. Like I do an audition, I turn it in and literally my agent will call me and say, hey, you book whatever. And I, I have to have them remind me what the project is because I just don't even think about it. Um, but at, but at, again, at, at the core of this, it's a business and just treating it like a business. In addition to like reading about acting books, I think people should read about business. They should read about marketing. So many actors I meet say, oh, I, I don't want to talk about myself. I don't want to promote myself. Well, Domino's Pizza would fail if they stopped marketing. You yeah, they would. Right? Sorry, I mean, so every, every, <laughs> the market. And so many actors don't want to do that. Uh, so you have to me, like, learn the craft of acting, learn the specific skill sets that are required on set, which include acting, but a lot of other things, you know, people skills, and then learn how to do the business that gives you the auditions that allows you to go to set. It's just a numbers game. The more auditions, the more opportunities to get yes. The go to set work that's it like I, you know when i was in when i was in college i sold vacuum cleaner door to door did and you yes I did. I I wonder. Wonder. I was, guys really <laughs> really expensive vacuum cleaner and i remember my very first day I, I you know there's like 10 of us young guys in a van they drive to a neighborhood and we just get out and start knocking on doors and the guys i was working with were complaining about the fact that you had to knock on 100 doors before one person would say they'd buy the vacuum cleaner and they kept complaining about that. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. All you have to do is knock on a hundred doors. And somebody's going to buy one of these ridiculously expensive vacuums. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I understand how this works. So this is what they mess up. Every door they knocked on and 
plenty of doors get slammed in your face. You get called horrible names. You get, you know, terrible things. But they would take it personally. They take it as a, as a personal attack on them or the product they were selling. So by door 17, they were just done for the day. Because it was just, they allowed all that. They, they gave themselves the sense of, of rejection when they weren't being rejected. There's a million things to be going on inside the house. That's nothing to do with them, right? So what I did is I just knocked on door one, fully expecting to sell my ridiculously expensive vacuum cleaner. And if the person slammed it in my face, I'd go to door two. And if I was at door 87, I'd walk up to that door, fully expecting to sell that vacuum cleaner. If they slammed in my face, I go 13 more doors to go. And, and then when some, someone every day would say yes. But the way I got those yeses, yeses, I just knocked on a lot of doors. That was it. Now, obviously, the more doors you knock on, the better you get at your sales pitch, the more comfortable, the more confident you get, right? So with acting, it's exactly the same way. Don't take any of them personally. And it's not a rejection of you. It's just they don't need you right now. So you do your audition. You do another one, you do another one, you get better at them, you get better at them, you don't take any of them. I don't take any audition seriously. I take my career seriously, right? I don't, I'm like, oh my God, this is a big audition. No, it's all the same stuff to me. It's just an audition. And I'll do another one tomorrow. Like I remember when I, when I first started to kind of have my career take off, I booked a, a really good role in a really big movie. And it was coming out on Friday night, right? And I was so excited. I went to LA for the premiere and I, and I'm thinking the world's going to change Monday morning. And Monday morning, I get an audition for another film. <laughs> you know, it's, and then another audition. It was just like audition for bigger stuff. But it was just another little step in this ladder that we climb all the time. That's all. Oh, what a wonderful analogy. I just, I love the vacuum story. Thank you. Um, and another thing with the numbers game, I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking about your marketing strategy and or sharing any resources, uh, specifically maybe for business that people mm -hmm. should look into any podcasts or books or whatever might come to mind. Sure. Um, well, I am a marketing whore. I just put that out there <laughs> because I understood instinctually from the very beginning that it's a business. Right uh, now, in my personal life, I don't. I don't. Even when I get together with my family, my friends, I do not talk about my acting career ever, unless someone specifically asks me about it, because no one else cares. Just like I don't ask my buddy how his career is going at the bank. They don't, you know, they don't. They, 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 so I don't feel the need to like share all of my stuff, right? Um, and also, what we get to do as actors is really, really fun. And most people don't have jobs that are so much fun. So I, I, I make a point not to just constantly bring up, hey, look at this really fun thing I'm doing. How's that garbage truck business going? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's just, because most people do jobs they do not enjoy, unfortunately, right? So I just don't do that. So I'll make those separations because if you go around and start talking about your acting to people in your personal life all the time, they're not gonna wanna hang out with me, right? But from a business perspective, I market myself to people who can hire me, right? So I use classic marketing. Now it's a little tougher now because you know the whole COVID situation was crazy. But for years, I sent out postcards every six weeks for years to casting directors, agents, whatever. And uh, I remember when I was in LA and I had not figured out the business yet. So I was doing tons of student films and short films. I was sending out postcards every six weeks to like top level agencies because I was too dumb to realize they were too big for me. I just didn't know any better, right? <laughs> so, grocery store, and and this guy walks by in a suit. He stops. He backs up and he says, "Are you Mark McCullough?" And I was like, "Yeah." And I, I don't know if I'm if I should run or you know, what's going on. <laughs> and he comes up and tells me, "I'm such and such agent at such and such agency." Is I've been getting your postcards every six weeks for three and a half years. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. And he spends 30 minutes telling me why he can't rep me. Because he's like, you're, he's like, I know who you are. He's like, but you're not famous. He's a like, rep, you know, movie stars. Uh, he goes, you know, we spend 20 minutes negotiating a $200,000 contract for our clients because I'm not going to spend 20 minutes negotiating your $2,000 contract. And at the time, I remember thinking, I wish I had a $2,000 contract. You know, I, mean? I just I had never booked anything professional. <laughs> And so he says, hey, great job. 
I'm aware of you. He goes, but you can stop with the postcards. I said, sure. And six weeks later, I sent him another postcard. And six weeks later, I sent another postcard, so on and so forth. One year later, he calls me up and says, you win. I'll sign you. And it was the fifth most prestigious boutique agency in LA. And I was a dude who had only done student films at that point, right? Wow. It was just tenacious marketing. So I've heard all the reasons not to do that. Uh, you know, I've heard people say, oh, casting directors hate postcards. I don't care. I don't care. I hate junk mail. I hate it. But here's the deal. If tomorrow I walk to my mailbox and I'm hungry and I open that mailbox and there's a flyer from Domino's, it's got a sexy picture of a pizza on it. It's five dollars off. I go buy that pizza and you ask me the next day if I like junk mail, I say, no, I hate it. But it works. There's a reason they spend millions of dollars on it. It works. So uh, I just sent out a mailing actually uh, on Saturday. Uh, it's the first mailing I've done since COVID uh, to casting directors, you know, directors, whomever is on my mailing list. So I do that. I send out postcards. I send out flyers. Um, and I can, I can actually show you one second. So now when I say send out postcards, it's anything I do, you can, you can put in front of it, do it smartly, right? I see people send out stupid postcards that just have their name or their their email address. Hi, I'm an actor. Or, Hi, I'm looking for work. Or I'll send like I'll see like really needy postcards where they'll handwrite, "Hey, I haven't had an audition from you in two years. I'd love to come in and see you." And I always think of like that's like the dude begging a girl to go to the prom with him. No girl wants to go with that dude to the prom, right? So even when I was doing student films and short films and low budget films I hope no one ever sees. I would send my postcards out <laughs> from a place of confidence. And the point to me of marketing is one, show that you're a working actor, that you can be on set and you can be trusted. Number two, show them what your brand is. And we can or can't talk about that if you want, but I think branding is extraordinarily important for an actor long-term. So my, my rules for a postcard is use a picture that either is a still from a TV show or film that you worked on, a still from another film that's similar. If you did a Civil War film two years ago and you have a new one coming out, well, grab a still from the one you did two years ago and use that. Or when you're doing your photo shoots, I always make sure like 10 or 15% of my photos from a photo shoot look like film stills. Just don't look in the camera, look slightly to the side, make sure it's a horizontal shot. So, uh, and I don't handwrite postcards. So I don't know if you're about to see this on. So can you Oh yeah, that? that looks great. Okay, so I literally, it's a still from a TV show. Uh -huh. I use the whole, the whole picture is the poster. This is a five by five or 5.5 5 times 7.5, I think something like that. So it's not the little three by fours, but you can, three by fours are fine. And then I have my little message here on, literally on the picture, right? And the message says, William Mark McCullough appears in season 11, episode 11 of AMC's The Walking Dead playing the heroin manufacturer Moto, right? I don't, now, obviously, people know what The Walking Dead is, but if I was doing it, if I was in a movie, you know, I would not describe the, the, the plot of the movie because that's not my job. I only describe my character, and I always make sure I either use adjectives that define my brand, or if it's obvious, you know, drug runner, villainous murder, whatever. It's like, okay, clearly, we know what that is. But it's short and to the point. They see the picture. They read the thing. They go, okay, I get it. I see what he plays, right? And then on the back... I use whatever, so the front I'm using, this happens to be a still from the TV show, but if, if I didn't have that yet, I would just grab a picture that looked kind of like what that character is. In the back, I use whatever headshot I happen to be using at the moment. And then I, what I've started doing recently is I oh, use wow. the QR code. They can scan that and that goes to my, uh, my link tree with my IMDB, IMDB Pro, my TV reel, my film reel, so that it's easy. I want to make it easy. Yeah, now, absolutely. Make it easy for them to just get exactly where they need to be right exactly and then sometimes if i have a lot of things coming out at the same time i'll send out a flyer like an eight and a half by 11 flyer oh, wow. and i just fold it in half and put it in an a10 uh invitation envelope and mail them out uh, my rule is for postcard there should be one message and one message only because it's just limited real estate okay for a full flyer you can list a couple things so i've got this film coming out on such and such date i've got this tv show you know you can you have more room so Great. that's the kind of, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think um, the last, when you first brought this up, the first time I met you, um, 
you also described putting any people that you worked with that were bigger names. You start opposite so-and-so in a role that was such and such with your adjectives for branding, correct? Yes, but the person should be someone that your grandma would recognize or your mom would recognize, right? Like I'll see people like, like I worked with opposite the series regulars on the show and they were amazing, but no one knows their names. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, like, so it has to, for me, I, I do use people's names, but they should be A-list actors. Okay. The whole point is they use their, their gravitas to shine a, a little bit on your name, right? So mm -hmm. if you work with Brad Pitt, you know, put Brad Pitt down, um, but don't put down the guy you worked opposite in the student film or the ensemble cast series regular on you know, some you know, cop show that most people have no idea that the cop show in and of itself gives you all you need, right? Solid. But film, there'll, there'll be a point you know, very quickly in someone's career where they're working opposite major movie stars. Absolutely put those names up. Awesome. Or, or a famous director as well. Mm, yeah, for sure. And would you, um, what would you recommend people take into consideration when they're trying to figure out their branding. Classes tend to be quite vague in my experience in saying you could play this. Well, maybe you could play this. Would you mind talking about specifics? Sure. Um, for me, the idea of branding, it, it's made up of a couple of things. It is number one, your physicality. You know, some people have, you know, you can't do a lot about your physicality short of like you can gain muscle, lose fat, things like that. But different people have just, different looks and that's what you have unless you get plastic surgery so it could be quirky it could be sexy it could be whatever so you take that um you take your uh what i call your essence and that's an energy that you give off without trying that strangers pick up on in their gut when they meet you and you can't ask your mom or your best friend what this is because they know the real you so you know it, it's funny when i moved to LA. I went there thinking I was going to play roles that reflected how I viewed myself as a human being. So my headshot showed me as a young, smart, justice loving, good, sweet, you know, and my mom would hang all those headshots up in her house, right? <laughs> it, it reflected what she knew, at least what she wanted me to be. Right? <laughs> and I'd go to these auditions for those types of roles and I would never book them, never book them. And I think, man, I'm doing such a great job acting, but I'm not booking these roles. And uh, I'd taken a branding, a very, very expensive branding class in LA. And uh, I got the results. I'm like, this is, this is silly. This is not who I am. And so I just put it away in a drawer. And a buddy of mine took the class with me as well. And he's like, okay, I can do this. And within two years, he was a full-time working actor in LA which is very hard to do, but he did it playing his brand. And he started with small characters and just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, leaning into those essence words, right? So for him, when he walked in a room, he could be wearing a flouty shirt and crazy shorts and flip-flops and you think undercover cop, right? He just gives off an energy of the guy who is working for the government. He's a prosecutor, he's a cop, he's a federal agent, he's an EMT guy. He's the guy who's gonna show up and save your cat when it's up in the tree right? He just has that energy. Hmm. And the, th the words that I got were not that. They were the opposite of that. And I thought, this is insane because I'm such a sweet, nice, kind guy. And uh, so years later, I remember I ran into a casting director. Where I, I had auditioned for a lot at a film festival. And we started having a few drinks. And, and she says, you know, you've auditioned for our office a lot by self-tape. I was like, yeah. She was, and you've got a few callbacks, but you don't ever book anything. I was like, yeah, true. And she says, do you want to know why? I was like, yes. <laughs> She's a really good actor. I was like, I don't understand what that means. She says, well, you, you do a good enough job in your, in your audition that every once in a while you get a callback. And you, and you come into the callback and you do your best job acting that role. She says, but you can't beat the guy acting who naturally brings that into the room. And she says, I've seen you in all these auditions and I have no idea who you are and what makes you special. You give me a different character every time. She says, why don't you figure out what you have to offer? And so I went home and I remember taking those notes out from my branding class and I said, I'll give this a shot. And I made, I made my headshots match the essence words and six adjectives. One month later, I booked my first feature film 
a month after that, my first network TV show, and it just went boom, 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 boom. And it started small. I just I just booked a movie, uh, Fly Out Friday to Chicago, uh, playing the. Thank you. The funny thing, I'm playing the lead in the movie, playing exactly what I played for my first five line booking on a network TV show. It's the same exact thing. Wow, right? cool. The brand stays the same. The size of the role gets bigger, right? So as far as specificity, I, I teach branding classes every once in a while and I have a very particular approach. I mean, there, there are certainly other ways to do it, I'm sure. I can say some things I don't think are effective. Uh, you taking a headshot and putting it on social media and telling people what they think about it, I think is stupid because you've already created an image, right? A picture. You chose a hairstyle and a wardrobe and all that. Uh, so they're going to comment on what they see in that picture. That's useless. They need to see you. Um, second thing is asking your friends and family what they think you can play. Well, your mom is going to tell you you can play anything because your mama loves you. And you know what I mean? Like, so it has to be strangers because when we're, when we're going 95% of our, of our jobs are given to us by people who have never seen us work before, right? It's a new director, new producers, whatever they they see your audition, they see your callback, they don't know you. All they know is what you give off as, as, as a first impression. So what I have folks do is partner up and go to like public places, like a coffee shop, a park, what have you. And I have a, I have a, a document, just one sheet of paper, and it has a hundred adjectives on it. And they print out a bunch of these sheets of paper and one person sits down and reads a book or plays on their phone or does whatever they want to do. And the other person goes 30, 40 feet away and just stops strangers and says, hey, we're in school and we're doing a sociology uh, experiment. You can't tell them you're an actor because if you tell regular people you're an actor, they immediately think, oh, they're confident. They, 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 that comes with baggage, right? So you want to make them think it's just a college class you're taking, you know, and you tell the person uh, this is completely anonymous because you don't want them to say nice things if they really feel not nice things. And just have them look at the person sitting there and say, circle all the adjectives that you think applies to this person is completely anonymous. And they do that. And when they finish, it takes a minute, two minutes. When they finish, there's a couple of questions on the back. You know, what do you think this person's profession is? What education level do you think this person uh, has? What's their so socioeconomic level? Like just big, chunky, you know, questions that you ask them. And these people just write it down. And I have people do that in different locations, dress differently, but still a way that fits you, right? So, if, when, so for me, I might be in, in a park in a jeans and a t-shirt. Some other place I might be in a suit with tie, because there's a, but I'm not going to go somewhere and wear a cowboy hat, you know, because it's not, it's not me, but someone else, it may be them, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea there is you go to different places, get different people's feedback, and it helps capture what strangers think when you're doing nothing. Right. And so what I have folks do is tally up all those adjectives from the, the one that got the most responses to the one that got the least. And then you very quickly just group them uh, like the intelligence factor. The, the words on the sheet might be smart, witty, uh, professor, educated. What that is, is different people are sensing the same essence, but they're just putting different words on it. Right. Okay. So you want to group those words. And, and again, I spent some time doing this, but I, so I have like, you know, 10 categories, that I think are the most important ones, you know, intelligence, strength, uh, you know, a lot of different things. And you see which categories have the most, the most picks, and you pick the top six categories. And then from each of those categories, you pick that one word that captures that essence. So again, in the intelligence category, you know, one person might be witty, another person might be clever, another person might be intelligent, whatever fits. And then you take those six words and what I tell people is you write them down before an audition, before a callback, before you open a set, you just read them. Not so that you do anything, but to remind yourself that if you do nothing, that's what you give off, right? And, and it just makes, it makes acting easy. I mean, acting used to be so hard and now it's just easy. Like, you know, I, I always share this, this, which I think is a very funny story. I'd done a taped audition for a film out of LA playing this uh, serial killer. He's with a group of, of uh, bad guys and they kidnap a girl, fully expecting to get what they want and let that girl go free. 
Well, they ask my character to watch her while they go off and do something. They don't know that my character is a serial killer. And so while they're gone, I kill her, I cut her open because I just want to see what she looks like inside, right? Just a psycho. My buddies come back, I you know, tell them why I killed her because they're freaking out. So in the audition, I literally talk to them like I'm talking to you about going to Target and getting some new socks. I don't do anything. I just talk to them. I get a call back. And it's a, it's a callback out of LA and the writer is there, the producer, the director, and the casting director. And I'm doing the audition, the callback. And about halfway through the scene, I forget my lines, which happens to me a lot. I always have the sides with me on a callback, but I, I, I don't feel the need to jump to my sides because in real life, I often don't know what to say. So I figure that's very believable in a, in a scene. So I get this point, I can't remember my lines. And so I just look off. And I'm trying to remember my next line. It comes to me, and I continue the scene. I finish up, I leave. And about three hours later, my manager sends me an email. And it's a forwarded email from this casting office. And it says, oh, my God, Mark is terrifying. <laughs> scene, he looked off, and we could all imagine the horrible things going through his mind. And the only thing going through my mind is, what is my <laughs> next line? Right? But the reason that works is because I found out that what my, my adjectives are, my essence words, are are dark words, they're violent, they're dark. Even though it's not really me, it's what I give off to strangers who don't know me. And so everybody's different. You just have to figure out what those words are. And then you lean into you know, different roles. Obviously you might lean a little more into this word, a little less into this word or what have you, but it just gives you so much strength because you know, when you walk in, you're not boring. You're not like everybody else who sat in the room out, out front. You are so utterly unique because you give off an energy that makes you special. You just have to embrace it. That's all. Mm, wonderful. So you said you do teach branding classes. And I was wondering as well about your 16 hour course. Do mm. you, I know you're quite busy with pr producing as well as writing, as well as acting. Do you have any classes in the, in this year that you've planned or are those on hold? Well, I, They've been on hold. I did. I actually did the uh, the sixteen hour class. I did one for free about six months ago on Zoom. I think I had like one hundred and fifty actors sign up for it, which was fun. Um, but it's just my world's been so crazy with the film that I made. So I haven't been able to plan classes, but I certainly hope to do some this coming year because I miss them a lot. Um, my favorite class is how to be a working actor because it, it, there's nothing about how to act. I mean, Keanu Reeves proves you don't have to be a great actor to be a successful actor, right? I mean. I think understanding the business in the long run is if you can only do one, learn to be a great business person as an actor, you'll be successful. I know so many amazingly talented actors who do student films, right? So you must know the business. That's the one I enjoy the most because I've seen people change their lives by taking my class. But then I do a branding class, which that has to be several weeks because you need to get feedback and you know there's a lot of outside homework. Um, and then I do just you run in the mill, you know, anybody can do an acting class. And again, we all know how to play make believe <laughs> today. So, but I'll definitely let you know whenever I'm going to do some more because I do miss them a lot. That would be brilliant. I think, I think a lot of people would really enjoy learning from you and hearing more of what you have to say. Um, I did want to ask about your transition from in-person auditioning to self-tapes. A lot of people grumble who were part of the industry pre-pandemic grumble about it, but I think your approach is a little bit different. Would you mind talking about the fun you have with it? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things I love about self-tapes. Um, there's practical things and then there's the creative side. With in-person auditions, I mean, it was just, I couldn't do what I do now with in-person auditions because again, I live out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I would have to live in Atlanta, LA, New York, whatever. And to do one audition can take up four hours of your day by the time you drive there, wait in a waiting room. You know, it, it's all inclusive. There are days that I do four auditions in a day. I could not do that in person. Um, I love the, the, the fact that I can just walk upstairs to my studio and record an audition. Um, now, for me, I have fun with the, with the technical aspects. I think a lot of people let that um, let it overwhelm them and they get too they worry about the technical technical rather than having fun with the technical at the end of the day it comes down to do you fit the role do you have the right look and are you given the essence they're looking for um, I think you can you know you, the audition doesn't have to look great for you to book um, 
But what I like to do is uh, I like to light my auditions the way I anticipate the movie or TV show is going to be lit for that scene. I frame it accordingly. So if it's a comedy, I'll be a little looser. If it's a drama, I'll go tight. If it's a super intense scene, I, I mean, there, I've done scenes where you don't see the top of my head or the bottom of my chin. It's so tight. Um, but for me, I think that if we can show the, the buyer what the product's gonna look like, really look like, that gives us a leg up. So I remember going into so many auditions where they have a crappy little candy cam, they're using the fluorescent lights over your head and it's shooting you from your knees up. Well, we all know if you're watching a drama, a powerful drama, what do we wanna see? Boom, right here. We wanna see the eyes, that's what the power is. So I wanna show them, this is what you're gonna get if you cast me in this movie or TV show. And I'll give you an example. I had a call back a couple of years ago for Ron Howard film. And I walk into the room and it's just the casting director and Ron Howard. And he's sitting at a table and he's literally eight feet away from me. But on the table is a six foot, 60 inch big screen TV hooked to the camera that the cast director's running. And I'm looking at him, looking at me. And even though he's only eight, he's eight feet away from me, What's on that screen is this. Wow. Right? Why? Because he wants to see what, what am I going to look like in the close up? Yeah. And, and it was amazing. You know, he's like, wow, this dude has been doing this a long time. He still wants to see what does it look like? Right. So I think that uh, embracing self tapes because in person auditions are pretty much dead. And I think every year going forward, fewer and fewer people are going to do them because it's just so much more time efficient to do take. There'll still be, I think, some in-person callbacks, but I think initial auditions, you know, that, that's not going to happen a lot. Um, but the other thing is, is you can try something out, see if it works. And if it doesn't, try something else, you know? And I, and I don't suggest like doing 50 takes, but like, let's say you have a little bit of action. You know, I do a lot of auditions with action. If I'm doing it in the room, I don't know how they're framing it. I don't know, is my arm when doing action completely blocking my face? Does it look silly on camera? So if I have action to do, I will often just do a dry run without turning anything on emotionally and just literally block it out. And does this work on camera? Does this, does this look good? And then I go back and do it and turn on the emotions. And you take three or four takes and go, which one do I like best? You know, and, and it removes the nerves. You know, you don't have to worry about like the, Oh my God, getting in there and you have bad traffic that backs you up and you're running late and all the things that can throw you off. That's removed. Literally a taped audition is giving you this perfect little playground for you to play make-believe with almost no stress. You know, like that, that to me is, is a wonderful opportunity. And the thing is, you're, in my opinion, you're not going to book a job because you're super charming in the room. Can you deliver the goods is what's going to matter. Brilliant. Yeah. And you know what? A, a question I had earlier that I don't want to forget to ask um, is about um, anything that from your childhood, from your adult life outside of acting, um, how do you employ those, those lessons in the room or on your tapes or on set? Has there been anything that stood out like, wow, that experience really informed a role that you ultimately ended up doing that just fit so well? You know, I, everybody, of course, has a different approach to acting and there's no right or wrong way. My way is I use everything in my life at every audition. Right. So I, I don't, you know, I personally don't do like emotional recall. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't bring up past things that happened to me to affect. I just play make believe and I pretend. But when I'm pretending, that's informed by everything about me. Uh, I mean, I play a lot of characters who are nothing like me and many, you know, violent people and horrible, terrible people. Um, but there are aspects of, of real life that can that you can tap into, you know, like I've certainly been in situations where, you know, I'm, I'm with my little niece or nephew and they're in danger, right? And pulls a part of your personality out that might not normally be out there. Um, but I don't really have particular moments that have happened to me where I say, oh, I'm going to use this for a particular role. Um, I think for me, it's more of an accumulation of life experience that, that just affects me. Like, you know, it's like when my, when my, when my dad died, 
uh, some of my siblings couldn't stop crying for six months and I couldn't cry at all. Neither of those are right or wrong. They're just the way we are, right? So the longer I live real life, the more comfortable I get in the fact that how I respond in a particular situation is fine. There's no right way to have an emotional reaction to a stimuli, right? So like when I'm on set and a director tells me this has rarely happened, but you know, a director says, hey, could you cry during this scene? They don't get the response from me that they're probably expecting because I can't promise you what I'm going to do. I have no idea what I'm going to do. What I can promise you is that whatever I do is going to be real and honest in that moment. I might cry. I might scream. I, I, I don't know. And I don't plan it, right? I just let it go. Um, so, so yeah, that's my take on it. I just, uh, I, I, I also, I think it's important kind of connected to this, not so much to feed a particular role, a particular audition, but I think it's important to live a life, hmm. right? Like, I think a lot of people can get into acting and kind of, it becomes all consuming. That's all they do, all they talk about. I mean, there's a joke in Hollywood, like no one wants to go to lunch with an actor because all they're going to talk about is their acting. You know, it's like the whole world's at. And I just think it's like, there's so many things in the world that are exciting and, 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 and there's so much adventure to have. And I think the, the more we do and experience and, and, and risks we take, the more exciting we are as actors in roles, like getting used to like breaking free of those constraints and just doing whatever the hell you want to do allows you to not be so safe as an actor. What's an adventure of yours that stands out in your mind as something that was a total break from regular life? Oh, Lord. Uh, I've had lots of adventures. Uh, let's see. I was, uh, I was backpacking uh, from Turkey through up through Eastern Europe, and I was in Bulgaria. And at the time, there were some issues in Serbia. It wasn't a good situation. And, uh, but I really wanted to go to Serbia. So I paid someone to sneak me into the country to, uh, see me across the border and I got into Belgrade and realized I couldn't stay at any hotel because the government took your passports and they saw I was an American and they they wouldn't give me a hotel room so there was a fort at the north end of the city on, on the Danube and what I would do is like a, a fort that's open for you know tourists okay about 4 30 in the afternoon I would just kind of mill in with with all the other tourists and I found this little closet and I'd hide in it the place would close at five by 5.30, all the staff would be gone. And I literally would climb to the top of like the, the fortress walls and I would sleep there every night for like a month. And in the morning, <laughs> I'd go up, and at 7.30, I'd hide in this closet and at eight, place would open all the tourists and I would just mill the tourists and, and leave. So for a whole month, I just stayed in a fort uh, in Belgrade. So that was pretty fun. That's glorious. I love that. Wow. Fabulous. I'm sure you have many, many stories of the of a similar I made lots of stupid choices in life actually I've done, I've done a lot of things I would not want my my children to do if I had any children yeah. oh my gosh well I hope to hear more of those in the future <laughs> um in terms of people you've worked with on set off set um is there anybody who stands out as someone who's taught you something interesting or maybe a lesson that you continue to think of periodically mm -hmm. There's been a couple. Uh, I mean, I'd say the vast majority of actors I've worked with has been a joy to work with them. And, and uh, even if I didn't learn anything, I had fun just playing make-believe with them. But a few actors really stand out. Um, Tom Cruise taught me that, number one, it's a team effort. It's not about you. Uh, everyone, there's been a handful of actors that working with them on set, you quickly realize it was about their personal experience as an actor in a scene, not about let's make a great movie. Whereas Tom Cruise is all about let's work together to make a great movie and bring your A game every single take, every single time mm -hmm. without excuse. And, and you know, the film I worked on with him, the, the script was very fluid. They were constantly rewriting it. It got to the point that the actors and I we show up in our trailer and we just throw the sides away in the morning because we knew that was not going to be what we had to say when we got to set. Wow. Uh, the writer was there. He had a laptop with a little baby printer and he was just like writing up scenes on the go and just giving them to us. Wow. So he kind of got used to like getting the scene and just learning it very quickly and just being able to perform. And Cruz expected you to bring your A game. 
And I remember I, I knew that I had like my big emotional moment in the movie was coming up that day, like later in the day shooting. And the whole day I kept asking for the new scene because I knew there had been a new scene written because that's what always happened. And no one gave it to me. No one gave it to me because why would they? I'm, you know, I'm a little small actor on the movie. And uh, finally we get ready to, to, to do the scene and, and Cruz and I had been working at the tail end of this big, huge C-134 military plane. And the next scene is in the front of the plane for my, I say it's my big emotional moment in the movie. Big for me. No one's watching the movie and going, oh my God, that Mark McCullough scene is <laughs> devastating. But for me, it's a big deal, right? So Cruz comes up, he says, hey, Mark, you, uh, you know your lines? I'm like, Tom, I haven't, I haven't seen the script. So he calls for it and immediately they bring it to me, of course. And uh, as we're walking to the front of the plane, he says, you know, the sun's going down and he says, at most, we have two takes. Don't screw this up, but he used a different word. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I sit down and it's like this super intense moment where I'm supposed to be terrified and I'm worried about getting killed and all this. He absolutely expected me to learn that scene and deliver it with about 10 minutes of prep. But here's what I tell people. In that same 10 minutes, we're sitting in a C-134 military plane. There's only four of them in the world that still exist from Vietnam era. Wow. There was an expert there on the plane who was showing crews how to take off and land the C-134. And I mean, there are just buttons everywhere. He's obviously a pilot, but he flies you know, Gulfstream, you know, new, new jets. And the same 10 minutes that I learned how to do this emotional scene, he learned how to take off and, and land this plane. And we took off into the air he brought around and he landed it. so it's just this expectation of you do it period do it so that's the thing i learned from him um i worked with Mahershala ali on a movie once and uh this was before he went on academy awards got all the claim and uh a couple by far he was the best actor i've ever worked with in my life uh he was unbelievably amazing but in the movie He's playing a recently freed slave, and I'm playing a horrible, racist, uh, former slave owner who literally kills him at the end of the scene. And I show up on set, and uh, we start, and I'm, I'm having to say the most horrible things imaginable that a white man has to say to a black man, right? It's just horrible stuff. Well, the director comes up and wants us to improv. So I start improv, and of course, I'm leaving out all the really bad stuff during the improv, because it's improv. And the director's yelling at me, saying, you got to say the words. And I, and Maharshala could see how uncomfortable I was. And he takes me to the side and he puts his arm around me. And he says, Mark, it's just make-believe. Don't worry about it. And he just took that weight off my shoulders. And it, but it, it showed me like, it's okay to play the bad guy, right? I mean, to tell the story of Jesus, you need the story of Judas. To tell the story of John McClane, you need the story of Hans Gruber. Like you gotta have the bad guy for the hero to shine. And he really just kind of, set me on that path. Like, hey, it's okay. You know, you're not doing it. The character's doing it. And, uh, and the third person is, you probably don't know this person, his name's Michael Ironside. He was uh, huge in like the 90s. But I remember as a little boy, my dad loved this movie he was in called Scanners. And I remember the first movie I remember seeing as a child was this movie that Michael Ironside starred in. And he always played the gruff, tough, you know, uh, guy in the movies. And I did a film with him. And Every single take of every scene was totally different. Wow. And I remember then in the first day working with him, he just looks at me and he says, it's fun dancing with you today. Yeah. And that's what he meant. And it I was like, yes. Because, you know, it's so easy in acting class or having a theater, theater background to like kind of like plan your scene. You go, I'm going to do it this way. And he's going to say it this way. And I'm going to say it this way. And working with, with Ironside, it was like, you throw that out the window because just play, like he would say something a certain way and I would say, and it just, it became this wonderful organic in the moment dance. Like I remember in college, I didn't really understand what in the moment meant. And Ironside showed me what truly being in the moment, not, not thinking about how you're supposed to say a line, truly being there and just letting the line come out. So those three really stood out for me a lot. Wow great stories too. You know, I can't wait to, for my own stories one day. <laughs> Working with amazing people. I mean, that is the education, like you said earlier, really working with 
the actors who are working and who are out there doing this every day. That's a real education, a, an experiential learning experience. So wonderful. And so you've been acting for quite some time. And at some point you incorporated coaching. I'm curious when you started coaching and throughout your time coaching actors, what have you learned from the people you've coached about life, about acting, about anything? What's something you've learned from your, from your students? Well, it's interesting because I, uh, I thought I would never teach or coach because, because of those first several years in LA being in acting classes with people who had never worked and getting horrible advice, I kind of got that terrible mindset of people who can do, people who can't teach, which is definitely wrong. Some of my favorite teachers now are very successful actors, but uh, it, was, it was a bad mindset. And I remember I, uh, I just started coaching a, a, a fellow who had gotten out of the military and he wanted to become an actor. He's like his mid forties, right? Never acted before in his life. And I just remember coaching with him, just one-on-one, -on -one, helping him with his auditions. And I, I, I so distinctly remember it. I got a call from my agent telling me that I had booked a uh, Matthew McConaughey film, actually the one I was just talking about with Mahesh Lali. And I was super happy about that. And an hour later, he calls me and tells me he'd booked his very first role in a TV show. And I was way more excited about his booking than I was about my booking. And I was like, oh, this is, this is exciting. And so I started coaching because I realized I was creating little joy bots for me. So even now when people that I've coached book something, I get this little feeling like, I booked something, you know? And so it's just really, and, I, and then as an aside, I had an acting teacher a long time ago tell me, you should learn to find joy in your friend's successes mm. because you'll be a happy person. If you're this type of person who is jealous or petty or upset, your life's going to be miserable. So uh, I definitely, is, if, if you aren't happy when you hear about your friend booking something, reevaluate what you're thinking and doing and change it because your life will suck if you don't fix that. If you have joy for other people, your life will be better. But as far as learning things, I mean, I've learned a million things from people uh, about all kinds of things. I mean, I coach a lot of kids and they bring this unique perspective to the world that I just find fascinating. Um, you learn about a lot of uh, uh, psychological issues that people have that hold them back. Mm -hmm. uh, and just seeing it over and over and over and over, I just see they're so easy to look. Now I can meet someone and very quickly go, okay, you've got this issue, this issue. That has nothing to do with acting that you need to fix because it's going to stand in the way of you becoming a successful, a successful actor. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a particular story, but, uh, but I just say like coaching folks uh, has brought me so much joy. Uh, and, and it's, it can be a lot of hard work. I mean, you, I'm sure you know, and it can take a lot of your time. Uh, and there's always a handful of actors who, no, no boundaries. <laughs> you know, you'll get like a 3 a.m. text message or some crazy question. But overall, it is, you know, I just find like participating in an actor's journey in this crazy business that we do is just fun. That's lovely. It's really lovely. And you know what? Another lovely thing that I recall from the first meeting I attended where you spoke, um, the bit, it was a sort of mindset perspective bit about when you used to go into the audition room and mm -hmm. look around at all the other actors. Do you remember what you said? I do. Uh, well, quite a couple of things there. Um, it's, you know, this ties a little bit into, into branding, if that's what you're talking about. Like, I, I used to walk into in-person auditions in LA where there'd be 50 guys who look basically just like me. And I would start casting other guys in the role before I'd even read for it. You know, I'd be like, well, that guy's super good looking or that guy's super muscular. I recognize that guy from a movie I saw last week. Why would they pick me, right? And, uh, and it was by embracing that sense of like, I'm enough and that my, my essence and my background makes me utterly unique because I bring the real thing. Like one of the things I explain to people is like my job as an actor is to walk into a room and, and put my little bowl of oranges on the table and say, hey, this is my bowl of oranges and they're amazing, right? But they're not bananas, they're not pineapples, they're not apples. These are oranges, right? Now, if they're not looking for oranges, they ain't buying my product. <laughs> 
But, but here's what I've seen in life so often. Uh, an actor has amazing oranges and they get an audition, they read the audition notice and they think to themselves, oh, you know, I really think they're looking for apples. So they take these gorgeous, juicy, wonderful oranges and they spray paint them red. And they, so they're sitting in the, in the waiting room and they're nervous because they're thinking, oh man, I hope they don't notice that I've got these fake apples. <laughs> they walk into the audition and they put these horrible looking apples on the table and they try to convince the director, producers, whomever to buy these, these apples. Well, of course they don't buy those apples because if they are really looking for apples, they're going to buy them from the dude who walks in with the real amazing apples. But, but long term, here's what happens. I take my oranges and I sell the hell out of my oranges, right? Regardless of what they're looking for. And if they're not looking for oranges that day, that's okay. Because in two months when they are looking for oranges, they're calling me in. The dude who has the fake apples, they're not calling him in. All they think about him is he has really crappy apples, right? So it's, it's really embracing that thing that makes you you and just without regard to character descriptions with what you think they're looking for, because you don't know what they're looking for. Many times they don't know what they're looking for. You just bring you and go, you know what? This is enough. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I love that. I love that. Well, and if you're spray painting oranges to pretend to be apples and you show them fake apples, they don't even know what kind of fruit you have. So how can they possibly exactly. bring you in later? Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There was another bit that you mentioned with the audition room, and that was about hoping that the person who gets it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had this little prayer, I say, whenever I go to callback. Uh, and it's that I just pray, God, give this role to the person who needs it most. And I find that just releases all the need and the desperation, all that silliness. Um, sometimes I get the role and I just take it. Okay, well, I need it the most, you know. But, but the thing is, sometimes there's going to be someone in that room who, if they don't book this role, they don't get their health insurance and their daughter's sick and they need it. I don't have a daughter. I don't need it. There's going to be someone in that room at some point who, if they don't book this job, they're on the, they're on the edge of quitting this dream that they have. I'm not, I'm not getting ready to quit. You know? So I think if you just kind of learn to give it up again, I use this from a spiritual perspective, but it doesn't have to be that, but just this idea that what's right for you is right for you and no one can take it from you. And if it's not right from you for you, you shouldn't get it. Right. Cause if, if you're wrong for the role, you mess up their movie or their TV show. Right? You should be a team player. So um, if you're perfect for it, and it matches, nobody can keep that away from you. You know, I, I had a call back years ago for a, a, a film called Logan Lucky. And I remember I, I, I did everything wrong. Uh, I got lost, I showed up late. As I walked in the door, the casting was like, oh, come on back. And I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not mentally prepared. You know, I walked back and the, uh, it was Carmen Cuba was, was doing the casting. And she, uh, she starts asking me about Savannah. She knew I was from, I was from Savannah. And she spends 30 minutes talking about Savannah, right? So I'm just like, oh, okay. You know, she was very, very sweet. Well, by the time it got around to me actually doing my callback, I'm, I'm just so not connected to this thing at all. And I do it and I totally bomb this. this that's not like a new cool word for good. I did a terrible job of this callback. <laughs> I walk out and say, man, I, I, I could have done some things differently. Number one, been there on time. Number two, just politely said, hey, Carmen, you mind if we talk about Savannah after the audition? Like taking the, the audition into my hands and taking my power. Um, but here's the thing. I booked the job. Was and I can you? tell you, it's for me. I could not have done a worse job this call. Back. And I guarantee <laughs> you, the four that were going against me in the room who didn't book it, they're second guessing their choices and their, you know, whatever. I was just perfect for the role. I didn't outact them. I wasn't better than them. I just happened in my little shape, fit that little hole in the plate perfectly. And so I got the job. They couldn't take it away from me, right? Um, and that's what I tell people. When I walk out of a, a callback or audition out, my agent's always like, oh, call me and tell me how it went. They do the same thing every time. I call and go, it was fun. They go, how do you do? I'm like, I have no idea. Ask them, but I had fun. You know, and that, that's, that's what I focus on. I just have fun with it. 
If I wanted to not have fun, I'd be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it, but that didn't last long, huh? Mm. It wasn't <laughs> fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> at all oh man well speaking of another career transition um had you always thought maybe just maybe somewhere in the back of your mind that you would have a production company and direct and write or was that something like coaching that took you by surprise tell me about that that did not take me by surprise because I have a slight uh, uh control issue like I like being in control no and uh, <laughs> So <laughs> those surprise, this didn't because what happens, you know, I'd, I'd done a ton of, like I said, low budget films and student films and stuff when I was in LA. And it got to the point where I'd be like, hey, guys, you shouldn't put the lights there. That's going to cause this issue, issue. That's going to be a problem. Or I'd see how they were setting up. I'm like, hey, when you edit, the eyeline's going to be wrong. And I quickly realized, OK, I'm now I know more about filmmaking than anybody on the set. And these aren't professional sets. These are obviously, again, low budget things, student films. and. Um, so I remember I, uh, I did a short film and just loved it. Like I loved it. It's just like, I love writing and I love directing it. I've never loved producing. It's kind of like, you know, you, you, you have to brush your teeth and kind of have to make a movie you got to produce. Um, but the directing part of it, I love, because I, I very much look at it like playing chess with big pieces, you know? Um, and what I did is I just started small and just slowly grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, you know, the movie that we're actually this week, we're in negotiations for distribution on, on my film with companies that if you if you told me 10 years ago that we'd be on the phone with the head of some of these companies, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. Like, it's just mind blowing to me. Um, I can't obviously say who they are, but they're massive companies. But it came. It didn't come overnight, you know, like everything. It, it's it start off doing little tiny things and messing up and doing it again and try not to mess up that way again, but being pretty sure you're going to mess up a different way. And, you know, just an accumulation of screw ups and learning from them and getting better and better and better and learning. Because obviously as a producer and a, and a director, there's so many skills, skill sets you have to know. As an actor, there's just a handful. Acting is easy. <laughs> when I hear actors on set complain, I just, I shut them down. I'm like, you know, crew gets here three or four hours before you and they're here three or four hours after you. And they're working all day long while you are in a trailer and you're giving a latte and you've got someone holding an umbrella over you. Like acting is easy, right? I, I don't buy this acting's hard thing. Acting's not hard. Uh, other jobs in filmmaking are hard, but I do love it. And one of the things I love about the producing and directing side of things is every single day is completely new. And one day, you know, I'm doing a hyper technical thing. I'm editing the film or you know, we're figuring out, you know, VFX, whatever. And the next day I'm pitching to the head of a major distribution company, trying to convince them to distribute our film, or I'm working on a contract or it's just, it's so many skill sets that have to be mastered that I never get bored. I mean, I always feel like I'm just, it's like that sensation where you're drowning and you're just kind of just under the water. You're trying to get above the water. I feel like that all the time. <laughs> and I, and I hope to always feel like that because I never want to be comfortable with it because I always want my next project to be a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. So I'm always learning, it, you know, it's, it's, that, that old saying, like, it's actually on my wall there. It's like, uh, jump and grow your wings on the way down. <laughs> I just believe that, like, I just do that. it and you'll figure it out. You know, if you're not stupid, just figure it out. Be willing to like adjust and grow and learn. So, see, so yeah, I do love it, but it, it was a, it was something that I think very early on, I thought to myself, I could do that. And, and I think the legal background really helps me out with that. Um, for one thing, like when we were doing our movie, we were supposed to start filming March 23rd of 2020. And we got shut down by SAG March 21st, two days before we were supposed to start filming. So we had the whole crew here at a major like semi tractor truck in my driveway, all the actors, all that. And we got shut down. And when we started back up five months later, we lost our, our cinematographer. So we had a cinematographer come in four days before we started filming and we had to shot list the entire movie in four days. Wow. And there were people who were freaking out and, and you know, you know they, they were very stressed out by the situation. And my cinematographer looked at me and says, he's not gonna get it, you're, you're, you're just calm. You don't ever get upset, you don't ever get freaked out. And I said, man, nobody's gonna die. I'm making a movie, you know what I mean? Like the worst thing that could happen is 
the movie sucks. It fails miserably. I look like a fool and our investors lose all their money. That's the worst thing that can happen. So, you know, I've looked like a fool plenty of times in life. I mess up all the time. Um, I don't want investors to lose their money, but they are rich. <laughs> They're not going to go hungry if they lost the money. Like, it's just, no one's going to jail. You know, as a, as a lawyer or working as a prosecutor, if I screwed up, either a guilty person could walk free and kill someone else or rape someone else, or even worse, an innocent person could go to jail. Those things matter, right? If you're a surgeon and you mess up, someone dies. We're making movies, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I just, it's putting it in perspective. I always tell people before they go into a callback, especially the old days when you actually went in person to a callback, it's like, understand that when you're standing outside that door, Nothing can happen once you walk in that can make your life worse. When you walk out of this callback, either your life is exactly the same because you didn't book the job or your life's better because you did book it. There's no downside. And I look at that with producing, you know, it's like, there's, there's no downside. I mean, it's a lot of work, but worst case scenario is not that bad. You know, I see bad movies all the time. Now, luckily, I think we have a really good movie. But, um, but again, it's just, it's just uh, I think having the, the legal background and kind of seeing people work in a business world, uh, in a legal world where things, where the stakes are so high that it just allows me to not, say not take it seriously, obviously take it seriously, but to not get freaked out by it, not get overwhelmed by it. You put things in perspective. And so why don't you tell us, you've been saying my film, my film, um, tell us about your film, A Savannah sure. Haunting. Yes, it's called A Savannah Haunting. It's uh, actually wrote it based on real experiences that happened here at my house in Savannah. Um, the house had been haunted for about 40 years since my dad had moved in in the early 70s. And um, my, uh, my business partner had come to visit me in Savannah from LA. And I didn't tell her about the house's history because I didn't want her to not come. And she was sleeping in the upstairs bedroom and horribly scary things happened to her. And so she got freaked out. And uh, every time she would come, like really scary things would happen. So finally she was like, look, you should write a script about this house. And that's what I did. And um, so here's where perseverance comes in. Like I wrote the script right after I moved back to Savannah and we spent years trying to raise money to shoot it. And there were so many instances where we get an investor everything would be fine, get the contracts, we would sign our end of the contract, and then it would fall apart over and over and over, right? Um, and it was learning to just move forward. And you shake it off, move forward, shake it off, and move forward. And we just kept doing that. And, um, but anyway, so the movie is, uh, is, it's about a family from California that moved to Savannah. And the reason they moved is they their young daughter had drowned in their pool at their house in California. And the mother just can't deal with the pain and grief of staying in the house because she was watching her daughter when her husband and her two other children went to the park and she took a nap. And while she was taking a nap, her daughter drowned in the pool. So she can't, she just can't get over it. Um, they moved to this old house in Savannah that is uh, uh, inexplicably, it's not completed fully. Like there's some rooms that are you know, almost as if someone was working on the house and they just left abruptly. Uh, and what ends up happening is very quickly, uh, very creepy supernatural things begin to happen to the mother. And she grows to believe that she's being haunted by her dead daughter who is angry at her. And things start happening to all the family, different, different manifestations of this thing is affecting the, the young son, the teenage daughter, the father and the mother. And um, there's a, uh, there's a local family that does their best to try to save this, uh, this family moves to the house, but it deals with like the history of slavery in Savannah it deals with civil war history. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's not a boo movie. It's not, you know, it's not jump scares. There's no loud noises making you jump. I, I want to capture what it feels like to actually live in a haunted house. And there's just this growing creeping dread that just builds and builds and builds until the climax. And, and that's what it's like living in a, in a house. Um, now, while we were shut down for COVID, we actually shot a feature length documentary about the history of the haunting, uh, its possible causes. And then we also cover the, the obstacles we face trying to film in an active haunted house because we had crew members and cast threatening to quit because of all the scary things that were happening. 
So that we're still working on. Um, but the narrative film we're done and we, uh, you know, it's been cool. And we did, we did a bunch of festivals around the world and we won a bunch of uh, best film awards, which is pretty unusual for a horror film. We won a bunch of uh, best actress, best supporting actress, best actor. Um, and we were beating out dramas for, for best film. So I was really proud of that. Um, and the fact that we shot it, we were one of the first 20 movies in America to shoot during COVID. So it was, wow. uh, it was extraordinarily difficult, but we got through it. Wow. Well, congratulations. I've seen the trailer and I think it looks gorgeous. So I can't wait until I can f figure out how to get my hands on the full Hopefully film. It's a it. documentary. I would love to, I would love to watch that. Hopefully we can be announcing soon. Um, once we nail down this deal, hopefully the next uh, week or two. So. Yes. Well, and speaking of obstacles, I'm wondering what you believe the value of obstacles to be in the creative process, not necessarily in acting specifically, but in, in the whole movie making process from all the different hats you wear. Mm -hmm. What, um, can you point to any, any changes, any developments, any outcomes that occurred because of an obstacle that wouldn't have developed that way had you had an easy sailing <laughs> throughout? You know, when you're going through it, obstacles seem horrible. And often looking back, they look like a godsend. Um, one of the things we had to do with the script, because you know the cost for COVID was so high, um, I had to do a rewrite on the script and get rid of nine characters because we just couldn't afford wow. it. Um, we had to simplify everything dramatically because we could, you know, there's a scene that takes place in a cafeteria and originally envisioned it having, you know, 200 students in this high school cafeteria. Well, we couldn't do that because of COVID. You couldn't have 200 people. We couldn't afford all the COVID tests. So what we had to do was be creative. And I think obstacles cause you to be creative. It's very easy if you have money to throw money at an issue. And I think a lot of big budget movies, not all, but a lot of them just kind of throw money at the problem versus thinking creatively to, to figure it out. Uh, now, I'll be the first to say there are things we couldn't do in our movie because of COVID that I wish we could have done. You know, there, there are things I was like, oh gosh, I really, that would have been amazing. But there are other things it's like by being forced because of, you know, time constraints or, or financial constraints, it, it forced us to be tighter and sharper and more focused. Uh, and, and I find that just generally speaking in life, facing obstacles is like going to the gym, right? <laughs> it, people I know who have an easy life tend to be lazy, not driven, people you know and people who face a ton of obstacles and overcome them and keep moving forward tend to be resilient and powerful and they're just people who get things done so for me like i, I don't mind obstacles at all you know I'm, I'm not sure if we chatted about it the last time we spoke but you know i was in a really bad motorcycle accident a little over two years ago on my way to a movie set and um it's, it's crazy how things come around so i was i was working on a on a civil war era film at this gorgeous mansion near Savannah. And it was my second day of filming. I was supposed to film the entire week. I was in almost every scene that week. And on my way to set, this little girl pulls out in front of me and I T-bone her on my motorcycle at 65 miles an hour. And uh, didn't lose consciousness, but I didn't know at the time my body got destroyed. Uh, I remember the EMTs come, they put me in the back of the, of the, of the ambulance. And I was telling them, hey guys, I gotta get a set. Like I, I'm filming all day today. I was like, I felt my knee. I don't think it's broken. And the EMT says, have you looked at your arm? And I looked down like the bone sticking out of my arm. And I had yeah. It's terrible. But that happened at 7 a.m. By 11 a.m. I was back on set and I shot 12 hours that day. And I shot 12 hours every day until Friday. And what I had to do, I had to convince the doctor to put a removable splint on my arm because he couldn't put a cast because I'm playing a Civil War era character. And the crew would, luckily this was close to my house. So the crew would, come to my house, pick me up, carry me to the car, carry me to set, you know, take me in my trailer. And then they would literally carry me in front of the cameras, a, a, a PA on either side and right, they, they, they go roll camera and the PAs would run away and I would balance on one leg to do my scenes, right? And then after that week was over is when I went and got all the MRIs and found out like I had destroyed my knee and broke every bone in one foot, split this arm, like, Horrible thing. I got, ended up getting seven surgeries out of out of all this. Oh my gosh! 
Yeah, my last one was this past, was February 2nd. But here's the thing, like people will come and visit me because I was, I was bedridden for six months. Then I was on crutches for another three months. Then I was on a cane for three months after that. When we started filming, I was still on crutches. Um, but it didn't bother. I mean, it, it hurt badly, but I never got depressed, never got down because I spend every day working out mindset and just moving forward. Now, here's the crazy thing. So I had worked at this particular mansion multiple times on different films and TV shows in Savannah. It's a mansion that was used in the movie Glory and Underground Railroad, like cool. beautiful building, right? And it's the kind of projects work on it that we could never afford. But when I wrote my script, I literally wrote scenes for that mansion just as like a placeholder in my head. And I was like, oh, we'll have to go get a cheaper place. We certainly can't afford that. We get ready for pre-production. And I thought, I'll just reach out to the owner and just see how much it costs. So I call the guy up and the guy that owns it, a uh, very, very nice guy. And uh, I ask him how much it costs. And he says, wait a minute, are you, you're Mark McCullough. You're the guy that's in the motorcycle accident on such and such movie. I was like, yeah. And he says, I was there at the house every day. I saw you coming and work and all that pain. They, you have this place whenever you want it for free. Oh, my Lord. And so we shot for a week there and we use it as a man. We use it as two different houses. We use it as our psychiatrist's office. We use it as a, the, like the yard for the house. I mean, just all these wonderful things. But I would not have been able to get access to that house had it not been for the motorcycle accident, right? So I'm just a firm believer things happen and you deal with them, but oftentimes something good comes from it. Wow, that is truly incredible. And I mean, dare I ask, was it worth it? Well, no, not for the mansion by itself. But here's what, what I mean, because again, like it, it was a brutal, devastating accident that I still every day I have pain from. Um, but I do think that there's something beneficial about just going through hard times. Mm. I just think it just makes you a stronger, better person. Um, and there have been a while there where things just came easy. You know, I was booking things all the time. My career was skyrocketing. Everything was going great. And I think sometimes it's, for me anyway, it's probably not terrible for life to knock me on my butt to say, okay, take a moment. Because it's so easy for me to always think about tomorrow. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Be grateful you can get out of bed and go pee. You know, something as simple as that. Just be grateful for today. And it was like the motor, or the car accident down in Nicaragua. Like it just, boom, hit me. And, uh, you know, I have the saying, <laughs> uh, listen to God's whisper so he doesn't have to yell. Unfortunately, I get yelled at a lot because I'm not very good at listening to the whispers. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it, it was... Uh, you know, it wasn't worth it for the mansion. I mean, that was a nice side effect, but, but I do think it, it, it showed me that nothing can stop me if I want to do something, you know, just, um, yeah, you just, you just have to, if you want it, you can do it, period. I love that. I absolutely love that. So in terms of your production company, the vision you have for it, I mean, you're going to keep making films, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. We do we films. We have some TV show pitches we're doing. Um, we have a couple of movies coming up that I'm really excited about. Uh, but we just like to make him you know, a partner. And I've been working together for years and she's brilliant. Uh, her name's Alexis Nelson. Uh, I think she got her first Emmy nomination when she was 24. Um, and she's, she's, she's the brains of the operation and the beauty. <laughs> I just, I don't really know what I bring to the table, but, but uh, she's, she's got all that covered. But um, <laughs> But yeah, but we just love making entertaining products, you know, so we don't really, we don't bring any like political ideology or we're not trying to preach anybody about anything. It's just, I want to make movies that someone can have a hard day at work, come home, turn on the TV and get taken into a fun adventure or a scary adventure or a sad, whatever it may be for an hour and a half, two hours. And just, you know, to me, like the classic idea of movies is just like a, an escape from a hard day. Wow. I love that. And any period pieces up your sleeve since you've got such great uh, architecture? Yeah, actually, we have uh, we have a prequel for Savannah Haunting that uh, takes place in 1864. And we would actually shoot the entire movie at that beautiful plantation uh, that, I, that I was speaking of. Um, we have a uh, 
We have a slight period piece uh, that's set in 2004. So not quite, so it's not, it's not 1864. And then we have another cool movie that we're gonna do at some point that's set in the late seventies. That'd be a lot of fun, so. Wow, that's awesome. I love period pieces. Like that's where I escape to. Mm -hmm. So can't wait to see them. Where can we uh, keep in contact with Fort Argyle films? Do we just go on the website? Do we go on social media? That's a good question. So I know that probably my social media would be the best because Fort Argyle Films doesn't have, like we don't have like an Instagram or, or we don't have a website. Um, a Savannah Haunting is on is on social media. It's on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but uh, if you follow me, I'm, I yap about, again, I'm a marketing machine. So I, I definitely uh, would, I will talk about whatever it is we're working on on social media, so. Great. Excellent. Well, I'll definitely be sharing you know, all of your, all of your links and whatnot. Um, I just have a couple more questions. So uh, looking back on the entirety of your career, has anything surprised you? Is there anything wish you wish you could tell a young Mark? Uh, how many hours do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell a young Mark, my God, yes. Like uh, I made every mistake possible when <laughs> I started out because I just didn't know any better, you know? Um, yeah, if I could go back in time, uh, I could have turned a 10-year journey into a one-year journey, right? And it would just been a couple of things I would told myself. Number one, like I said earlier, Mark, you're good enough just like you are. Just walk in the door and own that you're fine. Number two, I would have told myself, don't listen to people standing next to you at the bottom of the mountain on how to climb the mountain. And I spent so many years doing that. And it seems so logical when you think about it. If you want to climb a mountain, you ask the person who's up the mountain, you know? And I just, and I see it to this day. I see so many people like, I'll, they'll come to me for advice. They will pay me for coaching and I'll give them advice. And they'll say, ah, John disagrees with that. And I'm like, well, who's John? Oh, he was an extra on set with me last week. I'm like, well, who cares what John says? He, he's an extra on set with you last week, whatever, you know? <laughs> I remember my mom, this reminds me, my, my mom was a lovely lady. She worked in the meat department for a while at Kroger's, which is a, a grocery store here in the Southeast. And uh, I remember she called me up once. She had some legal questions. Hmm. Sure, mama, here's what I think, you know, the legal approach is. She was, uh, Mark, Kim completely disagrees with you. And I'm like, well, mom, who's Kim? She works with me in the meat department. <laughs> I was like, okay, mom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, everyone's opinion is not equal. Right. Okay. So I would have told myself, Mark, stop taking classes from people who have not done a single thing more than you at what you want to do. You know, I was like, I've done some plumbing at my house by watching YouTube videos. I am not a plumber. I could not teach people how to be a plumber. However, if you know nothing about plumbing, I can make you think I do because I might know just a little bit more than you. Right. So it would be go find people who know what they're talking about and learn from them. Right. That, that, that would have been super important. Um, and then I think it was also like, Mark, acting's easy. Stop making it complicated. You know, stop, stop, stop trying to deliver some performance versus just live in the moment and trust that that's good enough. And I think those are the three things that I would have. Uh, I would have told the, the, the Mark arriving in LA and it would have made my, and the other thing I would have told the Mark arriving in LA is don't go to LA. That was a huge mistake. Um, I tell people that all the time now, don't go to LA or New York, go to Atlanta, Chicago, you know, go, to, go to smaller markets where your chances for getting seen and working are much higher. And then once you build up a nice resume, then go to LA or New York if you want to. Well, and you're living proof that you can technically live anywhere. Right. With today's technology, you can live anywhere. Um, and I literally, in the last few years, I've worked all over the U.S. I've worked in South America. I did a movie in Ukraine. Uh, it just doesn't, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving Friday for Chicago. Uh, you know, I just doesn't matter. I mean, you send it, you send it your, your taped audition, doesn't matter where you are. Isn't that wonderful? It it's is. just, now I, we're going to get to see so many stories told by people we never would have gotten to see stories told by now, which is yeah. so amazing. I have and one more question. Going on vacation, yeah. like you used to go on vacation, you couldn't audition. 
And now yeah. I just take the camera with me, you know? You're like, you can do it, you can tape an audition in a hotel. I literally did an audition in Romania a couple months ago. You know, like, didn't matter. I just taped it and sent it in. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really, really awesome. I just have one more question. And that is, by the end of your life and the end of your career, what legacy would you like to leave behind as a creator? I think probably a couple things. Uh, as an, as a uh, filmmaker, I like people to say, man, he made really good movies. Right? I mean, I, nothing more than that. Again, I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not making movies to change the world. I'm making movies to entertain people. Uh, and as an actor, I like people to think he really helped tell a good story. At the end of the day, that's all we are as actors. We're assistant storytellers, you know. And uh, I like to, I like to think of myself as as good at helping tell a story and just serving the purpose. The story is what's most important. Um, it's not about me. So. Well, that's wonderful. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? You know, I could probably sit here for six hours. There's so many things. Uh, yeah. I, especially now that I don't do any coaching. There's so many things I like sharing with people. Obviously, you've heard me yapping now the last couple of hours, but um, no, nothing in particular, nothing in particular. Well, I hope to hear much more in the future. I hope you'll let us know when we have uh, any courses upcoming, um, any workshops, anything that you might be telling stories at. So uh, I'll definitely link everything below. It has been a joy, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me and for enlightening my community with all your stories. Well, thank you for letting me join you. I had, I had so much fun. Till next time. If you can think of anybody in your network who you think would be a great addition to our interview series, please do not hesitate to share their email with me or to send my channel or my email address to them. I am all ears for any industry professionals, actors, writers, directors, crew, producers, anybody, anybody who you think would have something to share that could benefit us in our journey together. Thank you. See you next time.